So one of the things I've been really doing a lot of is 3D printing. And as you've seen in some of my projects, I've been pretty consistently 3D printing over the last couple of weeks, uh, even over the last couple of months, actually. Um, the 3D printed case for my amplifier, the 3D printed case and bezel for Pi Zero W, the 3D printed front panel, um, what else have I done? Uh, I know there's other things. So I'm just I've thrown a lot of things away because I've uh, gone through various iterations. A lot of what I've been doing on the printer was actually the case for this. I probably printed this particular case out about ten times, refining where I place all the holes and all that kind of stuff. Because when you measure something, it never turns out the way you want it to. Uh, one of the longest and biggest prints I've ever done, though, on any printer anywhere um, is one I want to show today. Now at work I have access to a Flash Forge Dreamer which prints ABS and HIPS together. It's a dual head extruder and the whole system's about 1200 bucks, all said and done with the software and everything. It's a really nice printer. Um, it's got a, definitely got a print, bigger print bed but you know, I really haven't ever had to use it, and I actually stressed my home printer, which is that monoprice 3D printer that I showed earlier, and I hit, I almost hit the limitations of my 3D printer, and I said to myself, I don't want to take my personal projects to work. So this particular project is one I'm kind of happy with how it turned out. Um, as I've mentioned in a previous video, I have a 40 meter vertical and it's all I've got. I can't go higher. I don't have any trees on the property here. Um, and so it really makes having a good antenna difficult. So one of the things I wanted was a loading coil. And I looked online a little bit and I found what it would take to load a 40 meter vertical on 80 meters. And the answer I found was approximately 15 turns on a 4-inch diameter core. And I thought to myself, great, I can just get a piece of 4-inch PVC, wrap some copper wire around it, and, well, what's the fun in that? That's just lame. When you have a 3D printer to print you an inductor form. So what I've got here is this is actually 3D printed, and this whole thing is almost 6 inches tall. The 3D printer I have is a limited base size of 4 inches by 4 inches by 4 inches, or, well, maybe 4.25, but anything bigger than 4, and you're kind of pushing the limits. So how'd I print this? I'm glad you asked. So I'll go a little bit over what this actually is, though, first, is this is a uh, just a simple... 25 turns. So I did a one previous version uh, that was 15 turns. This is 25 turns over the course of 6 inches. One of the things you'll notice though as this thing focuses is that there is a seam right here. Now I've already glued these two halves together so you can't really see the details here but this also has a groove in it. Now, if I had a fancy milling lathe, I could groove, you know, do a certain number of turns per inch and set it up and have it groove. Um, it'll be quiet, you little thing. Um, mill a groove into a piece of four inch PVC, but then I don't have a thousand dollar lathe. I have a two hundred dollar three D printer. So, this was printed in two pieces, and each half takes about 12 hours to print. This was done with black ABS on a 20% infill. Now, when I did this helix though, I didn't just want to take two pieces together and or take two pieces and glue them together. I wanted them to line up appropriately. So where this thing is joined together, uh, if I can find it right here, is you've got this helix that crosses over and it's a smooth transition and I designed it that way very specifically so what I want to do a little bit is go over the actual design of this particular uh, coil so what's the exact inductance I don't know I don't care it loads my 40 meter vertical up on 80 it's good enough it was kind of trial and error basically so this is the final product let's go to the design a little bit 
So for doing that, I usually have to bring this a little closer. And I'm using my cell phone in a cheap, cheesy stand. And believe it or not, I'm using a GoPro to actually hold my cell phone up. So it's ghetto. It works. Okay. So this is my OpenSCAD model for the inductor support. I want to make sure that I have the entire window that you can see as what I can see. So let's get this appropriately sized. There. Okay. So what you see here is what I've actually modeled as my wire. So in OpenSCAD, there really is a kind of a poor way. There's no good way to make a path with an extrusion. There's other weird ways. And I just kind of finally said, I'm going to do this in a really stupid way. So like my previous method, you can see here I have a main function uh, with a difference in it and a support. Port. So I'll, I'll show the support later, but it's then subtracting out some other stuff. There's a hole in the model here where the wire passes through. That's what this cylinder is right here. It has the helix, and then there's these detents and stuff. Hmm, kind of interesting. I'll go cover those in a little bit, but first I want to talk about how I did the helix. So, as the comment on the code says, the helix is actually just a crap ton of cylinders rotated around and shifted. It's very kludged together, but it does work. All this is is a for loop that is creating a bunch of cylinders that have a radius of whatever wire radius I want. And they have a very coarse approximation of four or of eight sides for each cylinder. So if I take this model and I zoom in on it, you'll actually see it's a hexagon. And so what I'm doing is I'm subtracting this hexagon from the actual model. If we look even closer at this model, and you'll see that this right here represents a single cylinder. And all I've done is systematically and programmatically taken the cylinder, started it at one point, so actually this might be a better way to demonstrate it, is I've taken a cylinder that is on the, on the main axis. I have rotated it upwards by one fraction of a degree represented by the circumference of the circle divided by the number of inches I've got in the model by, and by the number of turns I want. So it's calculated as to what angle or what angle we want to have it angled upwards at. And then all it does is it says shift it up by that amount of, or put, a, put one cylinder in, put another cylinder in, rotate it around this z-axis, so it takes one, one piece here, puts one piece here, one piece here, and keeps doing that all the way up around. And it's doing it in, I think, looks like quarter inch sections. So each one of these is a quarter inch long cylinder that overlaps with the next. And in the end, you get, as far as what I'm cared about, is a groove, or rather a wire, and I only care about this inner half here, because that's what I'm going to subtract out from the support. So now you can kind of see how I did the wiring here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in the support. So let's save that, and I'm going to redo the preview, and it might take a little bit to calculate. Ah, uh, here we go. So here's, it's very slow, even on my computer, this is not a horrible computer, but it's not a great computer, is you can see I've got the actual cylinder, and then I've subtracted out the, the helix. And the helix is only halfway into the cylinder, it's intentional. I don't want a circular groove, I want a half circle groove, because a circular groove inside here would be fully inside the model. It's kind of stupid to do. You'll note that I have these detents in here. And if I go to the, I think it's going to go to the top view. There we go. Oh. Is you can see how I've alternated the detents in here. So I have a raised detent and then a lowered detent. And they are symmetrical about the X and Y axes. I designed this so that when the helix 
crosses a particular point, it crosses the flat plane. Let's see if I can show this thing. So it's below the plane, the flat plane of this on this side, and it crosses right here. The center of this is exactly right here. So what I can do with this model is I print out one of these things, and then I print out another one, and it flips over and exactly mates in place. And so when this gets flipped over, this detente fits into this hole and so on and so forth, and it's all self-aligning. All I have to do is make sure I get the orientation correct. And what makes life easy is that in this particular model, where the holes cross over is here's one hole, and here's the other hole on the opposite side. So it goes, on, goes crossways here, and it actually crosses the model on, uh, I think this is going to be, so this is going to be the Z plane here. So it's actually crossing at the Z plane. So this model is actually flipped up this way. Anyway, all I did then was glue the two halves together with some super glue right down the middle. Everything's self aligned. It's nice and sturdy and strong. It's actually, if you look in, I don't know if you can really see it here. Let's see if I can't do it with the backlighting, but. No, you really can't see it. It's going to be easier to see in the computer model. Is that it's not th it's not this thick here from here to here all the way down. It's only that thick for this for certain portion here, and then there's an, a tapered angle. So when it prints this, it actually is printing about a quarter inch thick, whereas this is half an inch thick. So only this joint area here is where it's half an inch thick, and that's where it really counts for making sure these two pieces are solid. This is so way over-engineered, but the simple fact is, is it's strong. I can stand on this thing. Now, I wouldn't stand on it this way because the way the 3D print works, it's not, it doesn't have as much strength on the, the, the joining regions between the layers, so it has a tendency to split in that direction. But when you put pressure on it vertically, I'll back up a little bit here. When you put pressure on it in this direction, it's very, very strong. And I can stand on this and stomp on it, and it'll never go anywhere. And that's only 20% infill. It really actually doesn't use a whole lot of material. I think I printed, with 20% infill, I printed, uh, what I say, 10 or so copies of this this particular housing and probably three or four iterations of this before I ran out of my first spool of PLA. So PLA is cheap. It's only 20 bucks or 22 bucks off Amazon. So yeah. So anyway, that's my project and I uh, hope you like it. If you have questions, leave a comment. Thanks. Bye.